So, Jack, thank you very much for sitting down with us today here in beautiful Norway. I've been here a couple of times, but we've never got to do this. Yeah. So, shall we start there? Because whenever we see you walk out to the Octagon, we, of course, see you with a half Swedish, half Norwegian yeah. big flag. So, how did this happen? Yeah. So, I grew up in, uh, in Sweden and uh, I moved to Norway when I was 19 years old. And uh, I have lived here ever since. Okay. So... Uh, I felt like, you know, my MMA career has been uh, built uh, in Norway. So I feel like, you know, I'm a Norwegian uh, MMA fighter. Right. But I'm also Swede, you know. Uh, I, I feel Swedish. I grew up in Sweden. And, uh, you know, if somebody asks me, where, where are you from? I'm just like, I'm from Sweden, you know. I live in Norway. So uh, I just feel tied to both countries yeah. in a way. So for me, it was always impossible just to choose one. So I tried to represent both countries as good as I can. Did you ever get any issues with the fans though? The Swedish, oh, oh okay, so that's a yes. Oh man, it, 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 <laughs> it never ends. It's still, after every fight, you know, people are just like, yeah, no, he's not Swedish, no, he's not Norwegian. And, uh, you know, it feels like instead of claiming me, they're just like shoving me over to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have thought they'd be uh, wrestling towards, but no, yeah, it's the other that way. That right? was my hope, but uh, it hasn't been that way. I think I'm about to make it worse because you recently told me mm. that there's some German in there as well. Yeah, it is. It so is. so <laughs> let's let's muddy the waters even more. Yeah. Where does that come into it? Yeah, my mother is German, so uh, I, I'm half German. <laughs> <laughs> but we never see any German on the flag, and, oh. and they could do with a, a good representative in, in the UFC at the moment. Yeah, definitely. But th then again, it comes down to just, yeah, I have German blood in me, but, uh, you know, my, my bonds are to Sweden and Norway and, and my, you know, the, the traditions and, and everything. Even though I, I of course, uh, I have some, some uh, German in my upbringing as well. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, let's... Let's paint a picture of your upbringing, yeah. because we have a very international audience at the UFC and every, everywhere looks different. I think we're all fascinated by that. So yep. your hometown, yep. like what's it called and what did it look like where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up in a small town called uh, Uddevalla. Not easy for someone like me to pronounce. No, and uh, it's on the Swedish west coast, uh, 50,000 people. Okay. Uh, so not not a very big town, pretty small, and uh, uh, it's quite close to the water. So uh, yeah, you're quite connected to to, to the sea, um, and. Uh, yeah, what is it more to uh, to, to to tell? Oh, is, that, is that it? <laughs> no, I, I I love my hometown. It's uh, uh, it's maybe not not the most flourishing town, but I have my all my childhood memories from there, right? So uh, when you grow up, that's everything you have, and uh, uh, I really re really love it. And uh, and there is uh, a few nice spots if you know where to go. So yeah. Uh, um, yeah uh, it's hard for the normal tourists, but if you you're, if you're from there, you know if I can show you around, uh, I promise you we have a, uh, some some really nice places. And the people you grew up around, you have quite a big family. Yeah, I have uh, five siblings. Oh uh, wow! So uh, quite a big family as well. How yeah. was that? Is it, was it? Um, have you got lots of brothers, or is it a pretty good mix? It's a mix. It's oh, a mix. It's a mix. Yeah. All right. So, so three brothers and two sisters. Are you older brothers? Or? Uh, I have one older brother and uh, two younger brothers, one younger sister, one older sister. So I'm thinking, I'm trying to link this to your fight career, obviously, yeah. and we, we often wonder, like, where does it come from, that mm. competitive streak? And there is a theme. I often, I often talk to people who have an older sibling that used to give them some trouble when they were younger, and all of a sudden they became bigger and stronger, and... That was the whole intention, but they took it sporting-wise. But exactly. did you and your brothers have a kind of competitive relationship or rivalry? Yeah, for sure. There was a lot of uh, uh, rivalry, but there was also just like, we just, lo you know, both me and my brothers loved the uh, martial arts. You know, we were very fascinated by it in movies and stuff. And, you know, after you watch a kung fu movie, you pause and then you try the moves yourself, you know, <laughs> and uh, and then you're fighting and uh, and um, 
when you're not fighting for fun, you're fighting because you're angry at each other. <laughs> so uh, it so was a lot of fighting. fighting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, my poor mom, you know, every time she was just gonna go and chop groceries or whatever, she came home, she knew that we had a fight, you know, so. Just the house was upside down. Yeah, so uh, always, always f fighting and uh, uh, always a lot of uh, martial arts in, uh, in, in the house for sure. So you mentioned martial arts, but I know from speaking with you before, it was wrestling yeah. that you actually took to. So yeah. how does that work? Because yeah. I think if you were like looking at Bruce Lee and Kung Fu movies, that would be what you would gravitate towards, exactly. but that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to. I wanted to do karate, I wanted to do Kung Fu, and all of those uh, martial arts, but uh, my mom wouldn't allow me, so that's... Oh, really? Yeah, uh, that's why I got into wrestling. That was the uh, only thing that uh, she would allow, so... Did she uh, not know that it's harder on the body no, than she, anything she else? Know. I'm just like... Mom, we're not punching each other. Please let me go to wrestling. And she's just like, mm, all right, you can go to wrestling, you know. But uh, and my brothers w went as well. So okay. we did wrestling, uh, wrestling practice, and then we watched kung fu movies <laughs> and did the kung fu at each other at home, basically. Mix, mixing your arts exactly. from a very early age. Yeah. What time or what age of, of your life did you put on that wrestling singlet? Uh, nine years old. Okay. Yeah, when I first started wrestling. Yeah. And you were pretty good as well, from what I understand. Um, I was alright. Uh, I wouldn't say that I was, uh, uh, you know, at a very, very high level, but uh, I did did decent. Uh, but no uh, international medals or anything like that. So, uh, um, and I think that it also comes down to your uh, teenage years, you know. Uh, I tried to mix the lifestyle of a crazy teenager with being a, a, an athlete, and that did not always work out that well. So right. I, th I think that's all, that was also one of the reasons uh, why, I'll, like my MMA career, I've been 100% focused and uh, on it. I can't, I can't go forward without asking about these teenage years <laughs> now, Jack, because you've always struck me as being like the consummate professional. Yep. Like I, I doubt alcohol comes near you for yep. maybe 11 months in the year, maybe more. Yep. So what, when you say you had some wild days, like what yep. was young Jack up to? Well, uh, we could put it like this. Now I maybe have been, you know, uh, drunk once in uh, 15 years or something. Really? You, know, uh, you don't know what you're missing. Or, or maybe, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Since I was 20 years old, I've been drunk like once or twice. Uh, but before that, when I, was, <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, uh, it was definitely wilder. Right. And uh, I, uh, I was very, very young, very early, uh, running outside and, uh, and uh, drinking and getting in trouble and stuff like that. Um, like, yeah, pe people in my profession often are. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is definitely a little bit of a of a wild kid. But it was just the environment where I grew up in as well. I think, like, yeah, I, I was no worse than the other kids. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, th definitely there was some. Uh, so, some uh, craziness in the, in the teen, teenage years. What were you like at school? Uh, not the worst, not the best. Uh, but I had, a, had trouble staying motivated. Uh, I'm really, really good when it's something that I like. Uh, um, like, for example, I, I loved dogs when I was a kid. I wanted a, a, a dog, uh, didn't get one. Uh, Mom didn't want a dog. But it didn't uh, stop me from being, uh, back then there was no, like, the Google, Google wasn't that good when you were a kid, like, so, yeah. so we went to the library and I could sit, like, with uh, just books about dogs and read for hours and hours and hours and hours and borrow the home and uh, I probably re read several hundreds of books about dogs. Okay. And so I'm really good at focusing at something that I like. But I'm really bad at fo focusing at something that doesn't interest me. So I think that was my struggle in school as well. So what direction were you looking to go in when you were leaving school? Uh, I didn't know actually at first, uh, but uh, my, yeah, the, 
the school that I went to, the, the last school that I went to was uh, was in uh, about animals. So uh, I was studying uh, animal care. Okay. Uh, and uh, I did work a little bit with that as well um, after school, but I felt like that was better as a hobby for me, you know, with, with nature and animals. Uh, I felt like the working with it almost took the joy, joy away from it. Uh, so um, I really didn't know what, uh, what, what I was going to do uh, after school. So where did fight sports come into it? Uh, yeah, uh, I worked with all kinds of different stuff uh, uh, at, at first. And uh, then I couldn't get uh, any more work. It was like very, very hard for youth in Sweden to, uh, to get work uh, around that time when I um, I finished school, so uh, there was actually a lot of Swedish immigrant uh, in, uh, immigration into Norway at that time. So I think it was about uh, 100,000 Swedes or something that immigrated to, uh, to Norway just to get the job. And uh, I was just one of them. So uh, I, I went over to, to Norway to, uh, to, to, uh, to get a job and uh, started to do uh, MMA here. I actually started right before I moved, uh, tried it out a little bit in, in Sweden, just because I, I found MMA in, uh, in my teenage years. I found MMA and started to watch it and really fell in love with the sport. And then I just thought that when I'm done with wrestling, I'm gonna try this. And uh, yeah, and then I moved to Norway, started MMA here and uh, yeah, just, just loved it. And uh, after a while I, uh, got pretty good at it, and then I thought that all right, let's let's do it, let's let's try this uh, and see how far we can take this. So a couple of things in there, because I know that Norway MMA is still illegal. Yeah. So and this always fascinates me because there's lots of people that are practicing in the in the gym that you train at. Yeah. But when you say you fell in love with MMA and you were watching it, was there anyone that you were watching with that was from your region? Uh, yeah, I was. I was watching uh, Joachim Hansen. Okay. Um, he, was, he was so excited. Yeah, to watch it was as well. really, really awesome. Watching him in in Pride, and uh, then uh, we got a couple of Swedes into the UFC. So it was a guy called Per Eklund, and then oh, da yes. David Bjelkeden, and then Alexander Gustafsson, and of course all those guys uh, inspired me as well. Um, so uh, yeah, th those were the guys. Uh, but uh, then. Uh, even before that, uh, it was uh, Vandele Silva and Bas Rotten that were my big, right. big favorites in, in the beginning. And uh, later on, my uh, biggest inspiration was uh, George St. Pierre. And I can see, actually, I can see elements of all of their games <laughs> in you. When I've seen, we've seen the Vandele Silva come out a couple of times, but yeah. also some of, the, some of the slick work as well. So I know that you trained with uh, Joachim Hansen, yeah. like, how, how did that happen? Yeah, so uh, I was uh, training at Frontline Academy and uh, I had only been training for a couple of months. And after training, my coach, which, which was my coach now, Mosin Bahari, he asked the group, is there anybody here that wants a, a fight? And I thought like, man, I want to fight. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't know if I was good enough to Pulled my hand up and just like, do you think I can fight? Uh, and he was like, ah, you need to do some more training. Yeah. And then he said, after uh, tomorrow uh, at daytime, come to this place and I will train some more. And we said, yeah, I'm up for extra training. So I went there down to a small basement in an old, old uh, boxing gym and getting down there. And then suddenly I see this guy that I try, you know, that I recognize. I'm just like, man. Isn't, isn't that Joachim Hansen sitting there? And uh, it, it was, it was. And uh, so I didn't even know that I was gonna train with him. <coughs> so I was just invited to train with the, with, with the guys. And uh, then uh, I started to train with him in, on a regular basis. And this was his uh, so-called uh, team Hellboy yeah. back then. And um, all of a sudden he was uh, yeah, my training partner and my coach as well. Do you feel like a lot of his style was what you were trying to build your game on? Yeah, I, th I think so. It really inspired me a lot uh, in, in that time. 
Because um, for those that don't know, like, he had a big ground and pound yeah, in exactly. his game. And I know that you pride yourself on your yeah. ground and pound. Yeah, he had really, really good ground and pound. And uh, uh, I remember that we had a lot of ground and pound drills. We also had a lot of up kick drills. He was really good at up kicks. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that was also one of those things that maybe not everybody practiced, but we practiced it uh, a, a lot. So that was some, uh, it definitely gave me some, some great, great tools. Uh, but then the game has also changed quite a bit. You know, mm. when he was fighting, the ground and pound game was... Uh, back then, everybody uh, on the ground tried to keep you in their close guard. Right. Close guard, pull you down. Today, everybody's framing, scoot back, get up, right? Yeah. So back then, it was all about posture. So we trained a lot of, you know, posture and hard punches in, in the ground and pound. Uh, while today, it's more about keeping you close to your opponent so they can't escape and then start to work your passing game and your ground and pound. Very different. So yeah, very different. So, but it all started there. And then I uh, just followed the sport and I started to study the sport and how it developed. And uh, um, I later became a coach myself. I'm not coaching him anymore, but uh, I did back then. And, um, and then I started to um, create uh, different drills to tackle all of these uh, new problems that came into the sports. I think that was uh, really important for uh, development of, of my own game. Now, I don't want to sound disrespectful to the group that you were with, but you just mentioned at the time, David Bill Caden, Alexander Gustafsson were back in Stockholm yep. where MMA is legal. And I feel like they had a lot more support because the Swedish Federation was maybe starting to be generated and have some say. Still nothing in Norway. Why didn't you come back home or go back home to Sweden and join with that group of guys? Yeah, I just felt like uh, I was getting uh, taken care of. And I felt like, you know, to be honest, at, at that time, you know, uh, Joachim Hansen, he, he won the dream belt and he was ranked right. number two in the world. I think BJ Penn was ranked number one. Uh, so it doesn't get... Doesn't Much get better, better than yeah, that. Yeah, it's yeah. good point. So I, I really felt like these guys are, they, they care about me, uh, they, want, they want my best. And the adjustment maybe doesn't sound like much to, to move from Sweden to Norway, but uh, the adjustment was, was pre pretty big. And um, um, I, I felt like, you know, I needed to, to settle, to, to um, not, not just move again. And, and, uh, and moving without having any work or any money and stuff like that, it, it's hard. So uh, you just want to make, uh, make your, your days uh, uh, kind of work, you know, and, uh, uh, and see if you can put, put your life together. Uh, yeah. Because uh, in, in that part of my life, it was all chaos. Uh, I just moved, I didn't have any money, I didn't have enough work to support my rent. Uh, you know, and then I want to have this dream about being an MMA fighter in the middle of it. So uh, basically everything back then was just to try to, to make th things work and try to, to survive. Uh, and uh, yeah, at the same time, keep your eyes on, on that dream. We've got to talk some serious business now. Yep. Fishing. Yeah. Fishing. I didn't realize how, how much of a serious thing this was for you. I can yeah. see already you're sitting up straight. We're getting, we're getting into it now. Yeah. I know that you've enjoyed fishing, but your team have told me that you take this to a whole new level. There's like, I didn't know there's technology yeah. involved in the rods and some of the stuff now. So, so please, I, I hand it over to you. What is it about fishing that is making you spend all of your money on all of this kit? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've just always loved fishing, even since I was a kid. And then I just go, went deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And then you have like uh, different styles of fishing. And I'm into something that's called like specimen hunting or specimen oh fishing. Right. And that means that you're trying to catch uh, some species and you want the, it can be a small species, but you want uh, the biggest fish you can c uh, catch uh, in that species, yes, you know, yeah. so... Uh, so most people are just happy for a catch. Yeah. They go out, they, they, you know, it's the, the prize, but you're like, nah, nah, it's got to have this colour, this fi these fins. Exactly. Wow. That, that's okay. how it is. And uh, in that path there, you know, you 
when, when you really get into something, you also get into the gear, right? Yeah. What's the best gear? What, what's the best that you can have? And uh, uh, yeah, I, I just like to get really, really nerdy about stuff. And, what's what's uh, the craziest piece of kit that you've bought? Uh, I have a, I have a pretty serious fishing uh, kayak. A fishing kayak. Kayak. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with like. Um, uh, sonar on it, and uh, you know, uh, eco sound, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, the, the, the roads are out, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's quite special. Could you buy a car with the amount of money you spent on the kayak? Yeah, you could. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah, the fishing gear is the most expensive things that that I own. Really? Sure. Yeah. That's incredible. Like the, the, the amount of fishing gear I have, it, it's worth a lot more than, than my car. But here in Norway, it's like we look around now as there's snow everywhere. Like, can, yeah. you, can you do this thing all year round? Yeah, you can, you can. You just go out on the winter, out on the lake, drill a hole in the lake and uh, get into it. And uh, even, even on the <laughs> when, when I do that, uh, it, I actually have like, it's, it's a bowl that's called the deeper. And you put the deeper down into the hole in the ice and it's uh, a sonar as well, so you, it will, um, uh, it will uh, create the echo sound, and then you will connect it to Wi-Fi to your smart smartphone, and then then you can you can see your lure on the screen, and you can see if the fish comes up uh, uh, after it. So this is crazy. Cool. <laughs> and how how long do you spend like outside of training camp when when you go on this? Yeah. Uh, as much as I can, but to be honest, I, I always try to hold back because of my training. Because f people often think that I'm a fishing is going to be a nice relaxation and so on, but it actually takes quite a lot of preparation. The weather can be cold, yeah. and you know, and then you need to, uh, yeah, it's hard to get the right amount of food in your system and stuff like that. So it's actually not, not so the best. You've got to get the right amount of food in your system. Yeah. Really? Uh, no, not for the fishing, but for the recovery after your training. Oh, oh got, got you, got you. Yeah. I'm thinking, I, th I thought, right, uh, I'm yeah. missing something. Yeah. I thought this was, you had like a, a chair that you threw down and it kind of opens up. <laughs> you have beer here, <laughs> beer here, the rod, and that's how it works. But this is a whole new level yeah, of fishing. Definitely a whole new level. But uh, yeah, I'm like... On the, on the summer, I can be out for a week and uh, just fishing. And is this something you do by yourself? Yeah, by myself. Most of the uh, fishing uh, days are by myself, but sometimes with friends as well. Nice sort of time for reflection. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and just to think on something else than, than fighting. Uh, yeah. yeah, kind of uh, meditation, yeah. But you, you say, think about this other than fighting, but I've seen that you've put a call out to any other UFC fighter that's shown an interest yeah. in fishing. Yeah. So I, I guess, I'm not surprised, you, UFC fighters are competitive in walking up the stairs next to one another. So you believe that you're the, the best fisherman in the UFC? I'm the best fisherman in, in <laughs> MMA, period. In MMA? Yeah, I'm the best Who's fisherman. Who's close? Who, who, would, who would give you a good run for your money? Nobody's close, but uh, <laughs> uh, you have uh, Gillespie has it as his nickname, you know, the best fisherman, uh, Gregor Gillespie. Okay, So yeah. uh, I, I guess he, he, he could, uh, he can fish, but uh, he, he can't fish as, as well as I can. Okay. So, yeah, I, I said it before and I say, say it again, like we need, we need a contest, we need a contest. An Anglian, is it an Angler's Championship yep, or something? Yeah, definitely. Uh, a small TV series, something like that to, okay. to settle the beef. All right, well, well down to your second love then and back yeah. to fighting. Yeah. So you've been in the UFC a, a long time now, main events under your belt. How would you describe your UFC career to this point? Uh, it has been a great experience. I came into the UFC 2016. Um, it has been going the right way, but also with a few setbacks. Um, but I think at the same time that the setbacks has uh, also made me grow and I have become a, a better fighter um, in my time in the UFC. And uh, I think it all comes down to that, uh, you know, I'm getting better and better and closer and closer to towards that, that that goal that is the title yeah I've been very lucky 
to be quite close to your journey from Cage Warriors yep. days. And I remember a fight with Mike Ling. Yeah, oh, that's early. That was, and that was great. Yeah, you were team Hellboy back yeah. then. You look kind of different as, as well, Jack, fresh faced. Yeah. That was one of the most crazy first rounds. Yeah. But I think we, we sometimes forget these early fights and what you showed in that, and I mean this respectfully, yeah. but your striking was no, yeah. the, the improvements you've made yeah. is fantastic, but also the heart yeah. that you've always shown. Because yeah. in that fight, it was, not dissimilar to like Vittori in a way, like the first round was pretty tough. Yeah. Well, it was just one round, but you came back. Yeah. When you look at your career, can you spot certain fights where you've really made a leap and a jump and, and let us in on a couple of those fights where you really feel like you've shown something new? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was a crazy fight. Uh, I love that one. And <laughs> I think that, you know, the heart has always been there since, mm. since the beginning, and that's something that's uh, not changing. I think that's also something that's hard to train. Yes. Uh, but the skills has definitely developed. And I started my career with uh, being 5-0, and and then I went on to a two-fight lo uh, um, two losing streak. And after those two fights, I went on a eight-fight winning streak. Uh, before I came into the UFC and um, I think that uh, my years in, in, in Cage Warriors um, definitely um, gave me some time to, to grow as a fighter. And I'm very happy that I didn't end up in the UFC earlier because uh, I really needed those, those fights to, uh, to grow. And uh, I think that, you know, nowadays people see me as a, a grappler, but there was like a, a time in my career, it took quite, quite a while actually before I r got really, really good on the ground. And uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, that, that was, uh, yeah, s somewhere in, in between there. I'm not sure which fight I, um, in particular, but um, was, it, was Mershart your your first submission in the UFC? Uh, yep, I think that was my first. Uh, and he's a decorated ground fighter himself. Yeah. So I think a lot of people were taking notice at that point. Yeah. Exactly. And then did you follow that up with David Branch David straight Branch after another well. submission? Yeah. Another black belt. Yeah. So um, and uh, yeah, today is definitely my you know one of my uh, strongest uh, strongest point in the game. Um, but uh, yeah. It's hard. You, you learn so much from, from every fight uh, th that you have, of course. Uh, but I think in the, in the UFC, uh, I had a big, uh, big thing after my loss to Thiago Santos. Uh, that was uh, when I got myself a mental uh, coach okay. after, uh, after that. And um, I really needed that to get uh, uh, confidence in my preparations, uh, my mental preparations before the fights. What so was I, missing, Jack? Um, I think that I was um, I was kind of uh, afraid of the things that I couldn't control. Uh, so there is in a fight you can be so much better in uh, than your opponent. You can outstrike him a hundred to one, but that one punch landed on the right place. Can can make you lose the fight, mm. uh, and uh, like I didn't like that. I'm just like, man, I can prepare so well, I can get so good. And there's always gonna be this chance in this in this game that I uh, that, that I'm gonna lose, and uh, that really uh, messed with my head. Uh, that I can't I can't prepare well enough. You know, there's always gonna be this because this game is so chaotic. Mm. Um, so he, he, he um, made me understand that uh, I can't focus on the things that I can't control, mm -hmm. but everything that I can control, I should be focusing on. And I should always try to improve those things. And um, so I kind of screened my, my whole life and everything I do, all my preparations, and I started to see that I will do this to get better at this and, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, now I'm super confident that I do uh, everything I can to at least 
make the odds go into my favor. Yeah. And that, that's all I can do. From visiting you, Jack, I, I've noted how kind of regimented you are. Uh, oh. What is it about your personality type then? Because you've mentioned this chaotic element that you yeah. sort of struggled with. You do seem very disciplined in your approach to the fight game. Yeah, I just love to have routines and to do things uh, in a certain way. And I think that gives me confidence and that also uh, makes it easier for me to be consistent. Okay. Um, so if I have good routines, I never think about what I'm gonna do next. I'm yeah. just gonna do it. And yeah. uh, what I do think about is how am I gonna do it well? So, right. uh, and that's uh, a very important part of, uh, a, a very uh, important part of, uh, of fighting and sports in general. And I think that a lot of people think that it's enough to just show up in training, uh, but you really, really need to prepare for the training and think about what are you gonna do today to make this practice count? How are you gonna grow from this and how are you gonna get better? Mm. And um, if you do that all the time, I'm, I'm sure that you're going to reach uh, progress. And many people ask me, you know, why are you always you know, in Norway? You, you never travel anywhere and train at other gyms and stuff like that. And I think that uh, I, I will make sure that I get uh, new challenges here at home. I'll make sure that uh, even if it's not uh, new Sparring partners all the time is going to be new exercises or uh, other things that we do. So uh, I think if you uh, really put a lot of thought into the game, you can uh, make a lot of progress uh, where you are at. And uh, as I said, if, if I'm too much out of my routines, I'm not going to get more confident that people might think yeah. it might be the opposite, actually. So uh, uh, I think it's, as long as I uh, put put work in and and uh, yeah I, I believe in in what I do I'm gonna be confident in the fights. Is there something that you've adopted, found, used since you've been with the UFC that's been a real game changer apart from having this mind specialist? Um, I think it really com comes down to, uh, to to the work uh, with my mental coach actually. Oh really? Because. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I do in the in the UFC really uh, com comes from him, and uh, it's uh, it's all about my my how my life is stru structured. But it's also about the routines before the fight, my preparations before the fight, when I get close to the fight. Um, the, uh, Visual, that's the hardest word in the world. Visualis visualization. Oh, <laughs> visualization. Visu yeah, visualization. The, the visualization uh, is a huge part of my game. And uh, um, how, do, how do you do that? Uh, <clears throat> I start off when I get a fight, a opponent. Um, I just start to think in general, and that's not really visualization, but you start to think a little bit uh, of the fights, how he fights, uh, <clears throat> and you start to think how, how long, uh, am I going to approach this? this problem and then you break it into uh, pieces and segments uh, different parts of the of the fight and uh, positions where you can uh, end up uh, how, how you will start in the beginning of the fight uh, uh, and so on and so forth and uh, so that's usually where I start thinking about the fight and later I also start to think about the travel, the big part. Uh, even when I'm gonna um, um, pack my gear uh, before I travel, I think about that, what, what I'm gonna bring, uh, when I'm going, the airplane, the travel down, uh, the weeks before. Um, and also now when I've been into, uh, in the UFC for a while, I know a few things that is gonna happen for sure. I know that I'm gonna sign those post, uh, posters. I know the, the people that I'm gonna me uh, meet. Uh, I know where it's gonna be at. Uh, I know I can, uh, I can get there, I can watch the cage. Um, you know, so I, I basically try to put as many things that I'm certain of uh, for sure 
uh, into my head. So uh, when I get there, instead of feeling, oh, this is time, you know, now, now, now uh, the tension is, is going up, I'm just going to be checking off all the things that I already had in my, in, in my head. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I try to visualize small things, but also the big picture. Mm. Um, so, um, usually when we get a chance to get, like if we have the weigh-ins and the cage is there, uh, I walk up and down into the cage several times. Uh, I lay on the floor there. I try to be just fami familiar as I can with that environment. Uh, you can always see the fighter goes into the cage in the shadow box a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I can assure you that if you watch me there, I'm, I'm, after the guy says he's gone, I'm going to be sitting there. I'm going to be spending as much time as I can uh, uh, around that place uh, where I'm actually going to fight, just to be as comfortable as I can in, in, in that situation. Um, so, um, yeah, th that's so, some of the things that I can do. Yeah. Uh, sometimes when I visualize, I just put, put the UC gloves on uh, just to uh, enforce it. Uh, to make the visualization more powerful, you, you can smell the gloves, you know, and almost when you can smell the gloves, you can almost smell the blood, you know, uh, <laughs> that's going to be in, th in the fight. So, yeah. A pretty comprehensive look at it. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I'd noted from your YouTube channel as well, which I think is fantastic, I think you've got a really good blend of the serious stuff. It's very, I know the guy who's shooting it, he's, he's very talented. Yeah. There's lots of fun on there. But one thing that stuck out to me was you saying you're you have so much fear and there's, you're prepared to die. Yeah. You're, you're comfortable with the fact that when you walk into the octagon, you're, and I, that feels very heavy. Yeah. Um, can you talk to me about that? Because there are one, there's one percent of the population, it, probably yeah. less than that, that gets to do what you do at that level. So yeah. for us normal humans, like it's, it's hard to understand yeah. what that emotion must be. Yeah. Um, I feel like when I'm in the cage, in that moment, uh, when we are fighting, for me, it really feels like a life and death uh, situation. Uh, it feels like, you know, my instinct, uh, instincts are just telling me to, to continue, to fight, to fight, to fight. Uh, they're never, never ever telling me to, to quit or, or uh, give up in there. And uh, it, it really feels like I'm a, in a fight for, for my life uh, when I'm in there. And uh, it's something that I've uh, experienced uh, in fighting. It's not like a mentality that I had before fighting. You know, it's not like um, I'm gonna go in there, I'm, I'm, prepared, I'm prepared to die, you know. Um, I, I never thought about, the, that, uh, about it uh, in, in that way because I think about it just as a uh, sport. Uh, but it changes when I get into the cage. So when I'm in there, I have noticed that the feeling that I have when I'm in there is, it feels like I'm in a fight for my life. And I think that uh, um, I'm really gonna do everything it takes to, uh, to get out of that cage uh, victorious. Uh, and that, that drive that I have when I'm in the cage um, it's just something that's uh, deep, deep inside of me and uh, something that I uh, actually got to know by, by fighting. I, didn't, I wouldn't know that I had it if, it wasn't, uh, yeah. if I wasn't fighting. Good point. Yeah, so uh, like, yeah, B before I, w I was never like, uh, as I said, I was never thinking that, yeah, I'm gonna go in there and it uh, doesn't matter if I live or, live or die. Uh, because it does matter. <laughs> of course. And that's, I think that's what I feel in there because it, it means so much for me uh, that, that I'm willing to do almost anything to, uh, to, to, to get the victory. And uh, that gets real when, when I get into the cage. And we've seen that shine through. I'm thinking of the Tullis Latesh fight. You, was it a rib that you broke? Yep. So, um, Often, I think that us commentators, we, we really respond to your war cry after yeah. you've, when you've got a win. <laughs> yeah. And we can see the emotion, like in that fight with Talish Latis. What is it like when you, it's not just that fight either, that yeah. you've suffered serious injury. Yeah. How, what is it about your psyche that allows you to continue? Yeah, it's weird because it's not that I don't have 
doubt, you know, when I'm, when I'm in there and I feel my rib go, and he puts p pressure on it, and I feel how it clicks, how it moves, and I'm actually thinking in there, okay, uh, if I continue now, it's gonna, it's gonna puncture my lung, you know, uh, I can really, really feel my rib moving now, and, and the pain was just insane, the most pain I've ever felt uh, was in that fight, and, uh, but still, I, and it doesn't make sense to me. If I think about it now, you know, people said to me, and yeah, you, after the latest fight, you, you're going to have so much confidence. You know you can go through that and, and, uh, uh, and win a fight. I'm just like, no, it's, it feels the opposite. I feel like <laughs> I'm, I don't want to ever go through that again. Right. Because it was terrible. It really, really was. Um, so I, I'm, I'm proud of uh, that I did it, but I, I really hope that it won't happen <laughs> again. And uh, if I think about it now, I feel like, oh no, it, it would have been, would have been easier to just give up. But I know with myself that when I'm in that situation, when I'm in there, there's just something in me that, I, as I said, it feels like I'm fighting for my life. And, uh, and uh, when you have that feeling, uh, yeah, give up is not an option. It feels like I'm probably leaning on some of the more some of the down points of, of your career, but I want to celebrate all of the bits. But the celebration, I guess, of your win streak brought you to a point where the UFC gave you a main event in your region, yeah. in, in Scandinavia. Like, yeah. what, what was that like for you? Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, still, one of my highlights, uh, it, it, one of the highlights in my career, when I went out in uh, in Stockholm, and that was the first time where I really felt that insane uh, energy from the crowd. Usually I'm just like tunnel vision, there is the cage in there. But in that fight, I felt like I just wanted to look everywhere and just suck it in. I'm just like, mm -hmm. these guys are here for me. They are rooting for me. And it was an amazing feeling. And uh, even during the fight, I could hear the chants. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, that was an amazing experience that I um, only experienced once. So I ho hope it's going to be more times. <laughs> yeah, we, we could do with uh, a couple more uh, big events like that back yeah. in this region. Um, the Cannoneer fights, yeah. a lot of pressure going into that one. Um, yeah. What was your thought process in, and how all of that uh, kind of broke down? Yeah, the thing is that uh, I think a lot of people afterwards were just, ah, man, the, the, it has to... Um, how did you feel? Was it a lot of pressure? And uh, of course it was, but I did, f did feel great uh, coming into that fight. I remember talking uh, to your fight week. You genuinely seemed at, at peace with it and you enjoyed yeah. talking to us media members yeah. and, and yeah. All, every, every step of the way. Yeah, definitely. And it was, it was a great experience until the, the fight was over. Right. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I think in that fight, that was a fight where I uh, grew a lot because uh, I felt going into that fight, I just felt like, man, if I just get him down once, it's going to be over. He's never going to survive that, you know. And he did. He came out, he, he, he got up. And I think that I was just thinking about that, that takedown. And he knew that. And he timed that uppercut. And uh, yeah, it, it was li lights out. So. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot from that fight, you know, I, I need to be more unpredictable. That was the biggest lesson from that fight. Uh, but of course, it, it was painful. I was in a good, uh, on a good streak and uh, this was my, my main event and uh, everything was supposed to go well. I had a huge, huge uh, after party done that loads of people attended. I didn't attend it, didn't uh, and uh, and I still have. Was that for medical reasons, or you just? I couldn't. Uh, it was me mental reasons. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I still have, uh, you know, I, I still feel bad for all the people that that came down there and went to that. But I just, I couldn't do it. I just felt so uh, so bad after that uh, that defeat. So uh, walking around and talking about that for hours to people. Everybody tapped me on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just couldn't handle it that night. So uh, it was definitely a tough loss, but um, I think that's also why you learn so much from competition. Mm. Because if you lose, if you do the same mistake on a training, 
next day you you, you almost you, you have forgot uh, forgot it right mm. but a mistake like that it takes takes a while to forget yeah so uh, you bring it with you and make sure to do the right adjustments now you've uh, you always go on to then you know get it back and yeah. and right the ship how good was it to to come back from that and get such a great victory following that one up yeah um Gastelum, uh, of course, one of the best guys in the division. He's probably the one that gave Adesanya his uh, hardest time so so far in in the division. And uh, yeah, knew that I wanted the fight to the ground, <laughs> but uh, that was uh, yeah. I managed to time it pretty good in that one because he was really going for it, swinging swinging after me, and I went under a punch. Came in on a perfect. Um, uh, entrance on the takedown, and I was gonna trip him, but Gaslam has a wrestling background himself, so he, he went to the lateral drop, a uh, beautiful throw, and uh, but then I managed to regain my guard and start my my ground game, and uh, first I failed a entrance on the heel hook, and then the uh, second time I adjusted, I I got it right. And when it's right, it's often. Pretty bad for, for the opponent, but yeah, we, we often think about you as the, the top guy, yep. not necessarily the guy who can threat from the bottom. So I think you've shown another layer to yeah. the competition in the middleweight division. Yeah, absolutely. And I, as you mentioned, I'm usually on the top, so uh, I, I didn't think he expected that. So, but that's the hard part. Also, now people know that uh, <laughs> I, 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 can, uh, I can be dangerous from the bottom as well, so people are going to be more care careful. Yeah. Now, it feels like you've been in the top 10, certainly the top 11, 12 for many, many years. You're, you're right up there in the conversation. And it, there's a, a kind of revolving pattern of those that are challenging the champion. And then yeah. you guys are all jostling for position. What is your thoughts of the state of the, the top of that middleweight pack right now? Yeah, it's, it's really special in the middleweight division because it feels like Everybody can beat everybody, kind of. It's just a matter of style and uh, who has the best night. Uh, so there has been, um, we have been having a hard time to get one of them that just stands out. Uh, so uh, in our division, it's more who can get a couple of good wins together and, uh, and that's going to be the next guy that's going to uh, uh, challenge for the title. Yeah. And um, right now, I'm. Um, uh, of course, trying to to make that happen, and uh, then we have uh, you know the thing is that Adesanya has already fought a lot of guys yeah. that's still in the top. You know, there is not a lot of change uh, in, in the top, so uh, he's already fought Bronson, he's fought Vittori, uh, he's fought Whitaker that he's gonna fight again, uh, and so on. So. Um, uh, Cannonier is one of the guys that he didn't fought. Uh, fought. Uh, I'm one of the guys that didn't, didn't fought. Um, so, and I, I, I know that uh, Israel is, is up for new challenges. He, he doesn't like the rematches. So, uh, yeah, my plan is to, to uh, get the W and, uh, and uh, yeah, go, go after the title. So, you're supporting Brunson against Cannonier, mm. Israel against uh, Whitaker, and of course you, you yourself have Sean Strickland. So you need a few pieces to fall in your, your direction for this to happen. Is that the kind of roadmap? Yeah, that would be the, the, best, the best thing, <laughs> definitely. So uh, yeah. yeah, you got it right. <laughs> have you, when you look at the champion, do you think uh, that your style is a particular problem for him yeah I think that uh, there is compared to your peers as yeah, well yeah yeah I, I, I'm 100% sure that I'm the biggest uh, threat to really to the champ 100% sure uh, Lon Brunson seems to be doing some good work yeah these days. I, I think that you know Brunson can he, he can look good uh, he, he really can but uh, I'm so sure of that like my grappling abilities are just miles uh, above his. Uh, he has the wrestling though, so uh, um, but as, uh, as you saw in his first fight with Adesanya, he did manage to close the distance there anyway. Um, but when it comes to the ground game, I, I don't think that 
No, nobody's even close. So uh, that's why I think I'm the biggest uh, threat. Um, before I let you go, Jack, I, I do want to talk about your last fights because in true Jack style in the last few years, like craziness just seems to follow you. Like yeah. it's so funny. We've been talking about routine and regimens and, and trying to limit the chaos, but you always step up despite the chaos. You say, yeah, I'll take the change in opponent. And that's happened. It's worked out well for you against Jacare, maybe not so much Vittori. Yeah. This situation with Edmund Charbez and you guys, your whole team yeah. came down with COVID yeah. just before the fight. And, and I, know a, a little bit about studying people after they suffered COVID, yeah. it takes a toll on your yeah. body. Now you got the win, I feel more comfortable asking you yeah. this question, but yeah. what kind of condition were you going into that fight? Ter terrible, terrible condition, terrible shape. So uh, I thought you might be. Yeah. You didn't look like it, by the way. I, yeah. I just kind of guessed that you might yeah. not be feeling yourself. Yeah, it was, it was so bad. Uh, like, I remember the first, uh, like, session where I was going to move uh, after uh, the fever went away and, and so on. And I had like a stretch of 100 meters. And I remember just jogging the 100 meters, walking the 100 meters back. And then I was totally destroyed for the whole day. I was no just laying, laying in bed and just destroyed. Then I needed a rest day after that. And then after that, <laughs> I tried to grapple a little bit with my coach on the, on the grass because we were still in quarantine. And uh, the heart rate just <laughs> right, right away went through the roof. And uh, yeah, you just felt like uh, you was gonna die every time you started to move. Uh, felt, felt terrible. And uh, then uh, we flew to, from Texas to Vegas and uh, we did a session on fight week uh, at the hotel just on the on the mats there and that's when my coach told me just like jack i really think he needs to pull pull from this fight and i told him just like sorry coach not gonna happen really? <laughs> didn't just, consider it for a second no I, it's just like i i can't do it i need uh it feels like when I'm there, I, I, it's just too tough on me mentally, actually, to, to don't, don't do it. It's, it feels like people think that I'm mentally strong that uh, go, go through it and, and do it. But for me, it's almost the opposite. I, I can't hand, handle to, to pull from the fight, go back, rest, train again, and prepare and you know a new date and everything like that. That's too much for me. I need to, because the build up, right? I need to do that fight and then I need a little bit of relaxation, you know, and, and, uh, and get all of that uh, energy out of me before I can refocus. So uh, th that's why I feel like, no, it, it's, it's not an option. I'm, I'm going to do this fight. <laughs> so uh, yeah, went in there and uh, managed to pull it off. Uh, didn't feel uh, good, but uh, yeah, we managed to do it. A veteran's performance, yeah. I think they call that. And I'm a big fan of Edmund Charbazi. I think yeah. he's a real MMA stylist, yeah. very dangerous. But you've been doing this a little while now, and I think you showed that kind of uh, just a few tricks. Yeah. You're able to control the fights. Yeah, it was like in the beginning, uh, I, I tried to follow our plan, and uh, it didn't work out because he was just better than me at at doing that <laughs> you know we're trading jabs i missed he hit uh, his uh, his jabs and uh, after a while i was just like no i need to do what i do best get into the grappling and changes and get him down and uh, and, and get work done we now have uh, a big year ahead of us in 2022 you're another main event this time against sean strickland so yes. again the ufc have given you that opportunity you're the poster boy for that event yeah. Must feel good to be back in that position. Yeah, super happy to be back in the main event. And uh, uh, it's just something about it. You feel like, okay, this card is built around you. You are the main guy. And uh, that's why people tune in. And it's a great feeling that I really appreciate. Uh, so uh, I'm 
really looking forward to it. Two cardio machines yep. can beat each other up in all the ranges as well. It's a, it's a really good piece of matchmaking. Yeah. I guess Sean Strickland's been on a, a very strong rise recently. Yeah. Is it the kind of puzzle that you're enjoying or is this a bit of a miserable camp as a result? <clears throat> well, I'm always preparing uh, as hard to, to any fight. So the camp is probably going to be the same. But uh, I like myself... Uh, um, a quick fight, you know, uh, the quicker you can finish uh, your opponent and uh, uh, get out of there, the better it is. And uh, this one makes up uh, for a war, of course. He's very durable, he, he can take punishment and he has great conditioning and he's uh, quite, quite a good fighter as well. So, uh, yeah, I can see on the paper that uh, it, uh, it looks like uh, it's going to be a war. But on the other hand, I'm going to do everything I can to, uh, to make it a, a, a quick night. And of course, the other added bonus with Sean Strickland is he'll commentate the fights for you whilst you're in the octagon with him. Are you, are you looking forward to that? Having that kind of <laughs> triple threat where he gets it verbal, verbal oh, fights yeah. as well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I remember preparing for uh, Kevin Holland right. uh, some time back. And uh, my sparring partners were told to... Uh, to speak to me and st start to try to mess me with my head during the sparring rounds. And I'm actually going to do the same for this fight because uh, I think there's a possibility that he's going to uh, throw some, some lines at me in there. <laughs> <laughs> who's, your, who's your best sparring partner for doing that? Well, tomorrow I'm actually going to be sparring with a guy from another gym. Okay. Uh, it's called Ole Magnor. And he's actually known for talking in his fights. Oh, so it's, no, so it's a it's natural perfect. thing for yeah. him. <laughs> Great. Uh, I love how you guys find... What body type do you fight? Yeah, I've got this, but no, I've got someone who's really good at talking to me during fights. <laughs> like, that's, that's such it. a bizarre thing, yeah, right? Yeah, but he's also, uh, he also has a little bit of that. He has a strong, strong boxing game. Right. And uh, he, he likes to go forward. Yeah. So that's also something that plays as well. So it works as well. Yeah. Uh, and one other thing, if I got this right, you hate flying. Yeah. So you've been spending most of your career <laughs> flying into your opponent's backyards. I didn't know this about you, but you don't even like to fly. No, and it's not that I'm scared of flying. It's just like, it's just, it's miserable. <laughs> just sitting there on your own little space, and kind, kind of some, some bad smell is coming at you. Uh, yeah. and, and you know, and the bad food, and uh, yeah, and you're just stuck there and that whoosh, the noise. Um, no, uh, I, I don't enjoy it. I don't, don't enjoy it at all. And I also had a lot of bad experiences with, you know, connecting flights that cancel flights and right. stuff like that. And you just like, you never know what's going to happen. Right. And uh, not, not uh, very fond of flying. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I'm loving pushing all of your hot buttons <laughs> today, James. It feels like there's a few things that have been messing with you. Yeah. So you're, but you're still here, yep. still doing well. Still rising to the top. So what does 2022 hold in store for you? I'm definitely going to try to... I'm definitely going to gonna go for, for, for a title in 2022. Uh, I, I'm going to beat Sean Strickland. And then if they have somebody else to throw at me, let's go. If not, give, give, me, give me easy. That's, uh, that's uh, how I'm thinking about it. So, uh, you know, I'm so obsessed of that title, so that's always what I'm thinking about. I'm yeah. just thinking about the other just steps to get there. And uh, I know that sometime the, the, the time is going to be mine. And uh, why not next year? I like the sound of that. One last thing I need to congratulate you on. You have a, your own business. I do. You're getting into the MMA business on the other side yes. now. You have your own gym opening up as well. Yes. Which is something nice, I guess, to kind of take your mind away a little bit from the focus of the gold. Yeah, it's great. Uh, we're going to open a new, new gym and uh, uh, we're going to have a full-size cage in there, which is a great thing that I didn't have before. Uh, it's also going to add to my game. Um, it's going to be big, so we're going to have a lot of space. It's not as, probably not going to be as cold as it is in my <laughs> gym now. Um, and um, of course, there's also something that I can have after my career to, uh, uh, to be coaching and teaching and... Uh, Help and so buy on. fishing gear. 
yeah. maybe a couple of dogs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's going to be exciting to to open up the new new gym. Oh, yeah. oh well, I wish you all the very best with the new business venture, Thank and you. of course, 2022. It's always a pleasure sitting down talking with you, Jack, and okay. can't wait to see uh, this next fight as well. Thank you very much, John. Cheers, Jack. Awesome.